I'm speaking today with Ed Barabal. He is partner in the manufacturing supply chain practice at McKinsey. Hi, Ed. Welcome. Hi, Bob. Thank you for having me. So what weaknesses do you see in global supply chains that COVID-19 has exposed? Well, it, it's a great question. Uh, I don't think that COVID-19 has exposed much that actually wasn't already being uh, exposed a bit over the past few years. I think as you've seen rising uh, tensions be certain, between certain trade partners, changing trade agreements around the world, the threat of climate change, disrupting uh, operations in different parts of the world. You've seen fragility in some of these supply chains already. And in some ways, I think COVID has been the final point that's really pushed a lot of folks to say, wow, the supply chain that I designed over the past couple of decades maybe isn't the supply chain that I need going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look across a variety of industries, I think you'll see that almost everyone has been worried about their supply chain. I think there's been different degrees that it's actually caused issues. Uh, but COVID, I think, has been the, the uh, the most public airing of something that a lot of folks have been talking about for a few years now. Well, as you point out, it has been a subject for some time, and a lot of people have been talking about it, and yet a lot of companies were still caught unprepared. Why is that? Why were they not prepared for this? It's interesting that you say that. Yeah, I think that part of it depends on how much experience they've had in the past with something like this. So if you look at some of the automakers after the Japanese uh, tsunami in 2011, which was another disaster uh, of a humanitarian scale, similar to what we're seeing with COVID, uh, it also had significant implications for supply chain. And the automakers who were really affected by that disaster, they actually, a lot of them invested in a couple of things that have surprised some companies that I've talked to in this crisis. You know, some of those automakers that were famous for just-in-time inventory actually built up a month's worth of inventories for critical commodities they knew could stop their assembly lines if they experienced a disruption. They invested more in regionalizing where they could to diversify risk across the world. And so I think that companies that had experienced something like this before at least had prepared. Now, that doesn't mean that they weren't caught uh, with some trouble in this particular crisis as well but they'd acknowledge the risk and prepared for it. And I think some companies that hadn't experienced that uh, perhaps just hadn't had the rigorous kind of contingency planning that others had done. Well, there was certainly a lot of talk about risk management in past years, but it was all around the possible disruption caused by something very local, an earthquake, a tsunami, a flood, a volcano, a work stoppage. I don't think anybody really seriously prepared for the idea that the disruption in question would literally be global. And it's not a question of just shifting sourcing. It's everywhere. So maybe we should give them a break on that, huh? That's <laughs> <laughs> a fair, it's a fair question. It's a fair point. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the interesting things for me on this one, and what's made it a tough challenge to get your arms around at the moment, is the ability to rapidly update demand forecasts, and also rapidly update your picture of what's going on in the supply base and the logistics system. I don't think any, most companies are not experienced the need to do that so quickly as you see in this crisis, both because of the sudden surge or drop off of demand, depending on your industry, and also uh, the rolling shutdowns of communities and countries in terms of manufacturing capacity. And so when we talked in the, the article that we wrote uh, a week or two ago about the need to digitize, that's one of the reasons that we really made that point is the companies that had actually digitized their uh, inventory management, supply management systems, and had tried to, to some extent uh, apply more digital approaches to sales and operations planning and forecasting. We've seen them be able to more rapidly manage this particular situation because they were able to keep up better with the changing environment. And so I think that's it. Yes, you can say that this was unprecedented. Uh, but I think the, the companies that have come out best of this or been able to manage it best were the ones who said, I think there's actually a lot of business value in having this anyway. Mm -hmm. And having those tools has actually helped them in this crisis. Well, can you be a little bit more specific about what is the relationship between digitization and the kind of efficiency that would give companies more resilience in the event of a disruption? Is it just a question of speedier response, more accurate response, different way you relate to partners? I mean, what is it, what's this magic about digitization that makes this possible? 
Yeah, it's a really great question. Uh, I can give an example uh, of something in this crisis. There was a retailer that in China, uh, as things started to shut down, said we have a couple of thousand of retail outlets in this country. And we can now tell that over at least the next couple of months, we're probably not going to be selling much online. Or sorry, we're not going to be selling much brick and mortar. We better shift our sales online. And they actually were able to rapidly do a few things because they had visibility in their supply chain and who they were buying from and could quickly get their hands on it. They were able to move inventory to stocking locations that were set up for online delivery. They were able to quickly get in touch with their suppliers and stop orders where possible because they had orders that were coming in for seasons that now there was going to be a completely different demand placed on them for what consumers were trying to buy. And they were actually able to feed all that information to their marketing and sales team and say, look, when we're doing online advertising, advertise this, not the stuff that we're going to advertise before, because this is a stock that we have on hand and this is a stock that we've repositioned for online sales. And when you looked at uh, that retailer compared to competitors, they experienced about a 5% decrease in their sales in country, whereas some competitors experienced 40% plus sales decreases during the lockdown in China. Mm -hmm. So you you look at that and you say, there's a lot of value in that. And outside of this crisis for companies that have invested in uh, getting a better, uh, just the basics of data engineering and digitization of things like their supply and procurement data, they often find value that they didn't know is there. Places are sole source, they could avoid being sole source. Mm -hmm. Logistics logistics decisions, and logistics methods that actually are maybe not the most efficient to get products where they need to get them. And so we actually think it's folks who invested in this who have before this crisis because there's a good business reason to do it. It also has really helped them in this crisis. Yeah. You talk about visibility. I want to talk about a different type of visibility. Maybe you want to call it transparency, and that is transparency to capital and operating expense. Is it the fact that companies lack that before and that maybe they're gaining it now as a result of the lessons learned from this pandemic? I think that there, so I think in this pandemic, there has been a rapid need to understand uh, for some companies where how much cash do we have on hand and where can we generate more cash. Uh, so absolutely folks have gotten a better understanding of their working capital and where there's opportunities to free up cash there. I really think this is also going to be critical over the coming months and years. Uh, if you look at a lot of the economic forecasting right now, there's a range of scenarios out there. And some of the rosier ones would say, Maybe by the end of this year, we start to see a recovery in Europe and the United States. But some of the ones that are more pessimistic would say it could be several years before we actually uh, are able to fully recover to where we were before the crisis started. And given that, the need for uh, expense and operating uh, cost transparency as well as capital transparency uh, is just going to be so critical over the coming months and years. One, to make sure you're resilient and can get through this crisis. But two is consumer demands are going to be changing. You're going to see differences in buying patterns for a long time. And how you actually are able to tailor your markets and what you're offering to that is going to really require shifting expense and shifting capital investments from some areas that maybe you're no longer going to invest in to those areas. There's a a major consumer package good CEO that uh, I was listening to a week ago. And he said in India, they actually... Uh, reduce their SKU count quite significantly when this crisis started because there are a whole bunch of SKUs that people just would not be buying given the crisis, but there are some that people are really going to buy. Mm-hmm. Uh, having the understanding of where you're investing your dollars, where you're investing your capital to uh, be able to pivot to those SKUs that you know will be in demand both in the crisis and then recover is going to be critical to success. Yeah. Well, if this crisis doesn't incentivize them to do that, I don't know what would. Real quickly, though, one additional thing is if all of this weren't enough, companies are having to struggle with the future of work, both employers and employees. Can you give me a brief statement about what that might look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are seeing companies in this crisis do things that they did not know that they could Uh, There was a uh, European hospital system that had been on a two-year journey to start doing telemedicine and ended up launching in less than two weeks. 
Uh, and so you're seeing this rapid innovation where people are changing delivery models that they thought would take months or years to change and deploying them very quickly. And it's been born out of crisis, but they're also realizing that though this might not have been perfect and we did it much faster than we thought we would, actually this new way of operating, be it uh, you know, remote supply chain management and planning organization, uh, the ability to uh, run a, a factory without everyone that is normally there present. We actually think this is something that we can sustain over the long term. And maybe there are even some things that we've had employees doing that just are not very high value tasks that we can either have someone do virtually or actually automate and free up that employee's capacity to do much more high value work, which frankly, a lot of them want to do. They don't want to be doing more mundane or you know, robotic process type work. And so we think there's a real opportunity coming out of this crisis, both right now while employees are saying, everyone's sort of looking to what is this new normal going to be, to say, why don't we actually embark now on saying what is the workforce we need a year from now, two years from now, and start doing the training to, uh, to get that workforce. Yeah. Changes on so many fronts, so much stuff for business to be concerned with. Let's hope that they really do learn lessons of the pandemic and go forward with some of these innovations you're talking about. Uh, Ed Barabal of McKinsey, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Bob. I really enjoyed it.